thanks for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Ray, Ray Brassier, and uh, this is uh, Thomas Metzinger. And uh, Thomas and I are going to have a, a conversation, uh, principally about his work and the, uh, the ramifications of his work. Um, Th Thomas is a professor of theoretical philosophy at the University of Mainz in Germany. Um, and he's the author of several uh, very important and influential uh, works in the philosophy of mind. And his work is um, distinctive in that um, he is arguably um, the contemporary philosopher of mind who has engaged most thoroughly and most profoundly with contemporary neuroscientific research. Um, so what is uh, unique about Thomas's work is the way in which it is informed by the very latest uh, uh, neurobiological data. And he has, Thomas has written, has collaborated with and, uh, and worked with uh, many contemporary uh, neuroscientists. Um, he's the author of uh, a book called Being No One, The Self-Model Theory of Subjectivity, published in 2003 by uh, MIT Press. Uh, and more recently, in 2009, he published a, a shorter um, encapsulation um, uh, of, of, his, of his work called uh, The Ego Tunnel, um, which is a, a work uh, you know, designed or addressed to a kind of a, the general audience, the, 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 the intelligent lay reader. It's an attempt to translate the basic uh, um, ideas that inform his uh, his, his principal work being no one to, um, for a kind of a, a non-academic audience. Um, now, I'm going to begin, first of all, by um, talking about, or asking Thomas about the, uh, the concept of transparency. The title of this uh, event, A Special Form of Darkness, actually comes from, is a, is a, is a quotation taken from Thomas's work. Um, the, co the quotation is actually is that transparency is a special form of darkness. And uh, transparency in, um, in Thomas's work is the idea that uh, uh, the world is, uh, we experience the world through various complicated representational mechanisms, but we never represent uh, these uh, representational mechanisms themselves. We have limited access to the, the, the machinery that conditions our subjective experience. And you know, the, the simplest way to understand transparency is that um, if you're looking through a window, uh, the, the pane of glass through which, which frames the, uh, the optical vision, the optical image uh, that you're contemplating, is not itself registered as an object in the visual field. In other words, the, the frame um, and the, the, the physical frame and the medium through which this visual, this visual scene is experienced is not itself a part or a component of the visual experience. Um, so first thing, so Thomas, I mean, as how um, is this, is, is what I've, I've said just a kind of an adequate description of the concept of transparency? And what, why do you think it is such a, a crucial um, idea. Why do you think um, it can? It has very, very kind of uh, significant implications for understanding uh, the way in which we experience ourselves. Hmm. Well, this is a steep start uh, with a difficult philosophical concept right in the beginning. So, in in philosophy, there are at least three technical uses of transparency, and the one you have mentioned is phenomenal transparency. So the first thing uh, to note is that this is a property of conscious states only. Unconscious states are neither transparent nor opaque. But it is not entirely true that all conscious states, all conscious experiences are transparent. I'll, if you remind me, I'll give some examples of opaque conscious states later. So let's take a simple example. The idea is if you all have this conscious visual perception of this microphone here right now. There are edges, there's a surface texture, there's a color, and in your conscious mind this appears as a bound uh, object. And even if you were be to believe what scientists tell 
us that there are no colored objects in the world. And this is just an internal um, microphone model that is currently active in your visual system, in your brain. It's hard to believe it because it's so ultra realistic. And transparency is about experiential realism. You know, if, this, if we would have a picture of the microphone, take a projector and <coughs> project it to the screen there, then you could say, ah, I'll go to the screen and I look at it closely and I'll see little pixels and things. And then I realize, oh, and there's a projector. This is constructed. There's a medium, there's a screen, there's a light beam. With conscious experience, you can't do this. You know, even if you would believe what this crazy philosopher says, that this is all just actually a reality model active in your brain right now, you can look at this microphone as hard as you want to. There are no pixels. And um, the empirical hypothesis is that the construction process in your brain is so fast and so reliable, optimized by millions of years of evolution, that you just get the final product, the content, a microphone in front of me. And that this is the reason that this is a transparently active neural representation in your brain right now, that it seems so real to you, that you just cannot believe all this should be, as I've sometimes called it, a form of online dreaming, right? And now the, a form of a very complex multimodal simulation right now. Um, why is this interesting? The first thing is it explains why all of us are, um, according to their own subjective experience, naive realists. I mean, it just feels real. You all, for instance, have the feeling that you're situated in this room right now, embedded. It's totally seamless and real. And in a way, we know it's not true. Could be the same in a dream. You know, it's determined by internal factors, the neural dynamics in your brain right now. So I'll just mention two um, applications of this. In my own work, the most interesting general step has been that I have applied this to the self model active in your brain right now. So I've said the human self model is also transparent, which means that the system harboring it, developing it, cannot experience it as a model. And that is how the quality of being someone of selfhood emerges in an information <coughs> processing system. If it operates under a transparent self model, it will, so to speak, gl be glued to the content of that self model. And for instance, as you probably all right now have the experience that you're just directly in touch with your body, that you feel your body from the inside, you're not. You're introspecting the content of a model of your body. You, know, you could have that experience in principle as a disembodied brain in a liquid, which was perhaps appropriately stimulated or something like this. So it's a local phenomenon in the brain, but the question is how does this super realistic experience A of not being in the brain and B being someone emerges? And in a nutshell, um, my idea has been that this identification, this experience of being infinitely close to yourself, um, that that is because large parts of the human self model are transparent. But then, and I, maybe I, I'll leave it at, there, uh, at that, there's a second thing, you know, transparency is not only about microphones looking ultra realistic or your arms feeling ultra realistic or the whole scene, there are other forms of conscious experience. I'll give you an example, certainty. If you shake analytical philosophers and say, now what is that, what is certainty? And it will say something very boring, for instance, like that is knowing that you know. You know, If you know something and you also know that you know it, that is certainty. Now we all have that. We all know the phenomenology of certainty, right? Sometimes we have these very deep intuitions and we have this direct experience of certainty. This world exists, I exist. This is an asshole. I, I just look into his face, you know, it's transparent, right? Uh, and um, this experience, if it's transparent, 
it feels ultra real, but it's just an appearance. So it could be that there are things about which we have this very, very <coughs> deep and solid experience of certainty, beliefs or intuitions or something, and there is no certainty involved. You would need a completely independent argument to show that this is knowledge. So things could really feel like knowledge and things could feel like certainty, but they could just be transparent representations in your brain. Okay. Um, this is, I'd, I'd like to, um, so I think this is, the point you just made is very important, I think, the fact that um, once we understand um, <coughs> the, uh, once we understand the kind of, the notion of transparency, um, we can't invest uh, phenomenological experience, which is to say our, you know, our immediate conscious experience of reality with the kind of cognitive authority mm. that many philosophers want to invest with. In other words, uh, many philosophers think that, and, you know, Descartes most famously thinks that um, obviously you can reasonably doubt lots of things. You can doubt that uh, the world is as it seems to be. In fact, you can entertain the hypothesis that you are in fact being systematically uh, deceived about the nature of reality but by an evil demon. Um, and it's always plausible to think that you are the, uh, the victim of a vast conspiracy which is uh, you know, kind of masking the true nature of reality. But what Descartes then says is that the one thing, you, know, you cannot doubt that you are doubting, the experience, the subjective experience of uh, bewilderment or of confusion is real, has a kind of an, an indubitable, indubitable authority, mm -hmm. which is why you know, Descartes basically argues that um, you can be wrong about how things are, but you can't be wrong about how things seem to you to be. Okay, so mm -hmm. and, and on, on this level, um, you know, immediate conscious experience has, for Descartes, it does have a kind of an epistemic authority. It means that you do know something. You know about how things seem to you. Now, one of the things that I think is suggested in your work is that because we, we are not entitled to be, um, because our certainty mm -hmm. does not have, does not license, uh, you know, cognitive certainty, it means that just because we're absolutely convinced of something, it doesn't mean that it really is, it doesn't mean yeah, that we I actually mean, know about it. What you mentioned is just that second notion of transparency, epistemic transparency. I mean, a classical assumption um, following Descartes for many people was, I cannot be wrong about the contents of my own mind. Mm. I can be wrong about things in the world, but I can't be wrong about what is going on in my own conscious mind. And that is one thing that I think has historically flown out of the window through 100 years of scientific neuropsychology, for instance, in the last century. We know just many cases where people are wrong about the contents of their own mind and not able to notice this fact. You know. Could you, could you give some examples? I think this is really helpful um, if you can give. Oh, well. Um, there are different forms of um, so-called anosognosia, where people will have a disease and not be able uh, to experience the fact that they have a disease. For instance, um, they may have a, a hemorrhage and uh, their whole left, the whole left side of their body will be paralyzed. And uh, you will come and say, so um, they want to go home and, uh, and you see, so how long have you been here? And you say, yeah, two weeks. And, why do you think you've been here? Yeah, people say my left side is paralyzed, it's not paralyzed. And you can say, could you please take your left index finger and point at the doctor's nose? And the patient says, yes. And the arm, of course, doesn't move at all. And then you will say, can you see your own finger in front of the doctor's nose? Uh, and the patient will say, yes, I see it right now. You know, or we have all these we have extreme, we know much better about extreme psychiatric syndromes like Kotar syndrome, for instance, which is just basically like the mirror image of Descartes. Uh, Descartes said, I am certain that I myself exist because somebody has to think or doubt. 
And these Cotard patients, they have what is called a monothematic delusion. You can talk to them pretty well, you know, they're not completely crazy, but um, they defend the thesis that they're dead or that they're not exist. And they demand, you know, take this body, throw it away, uh, get dispose of it, get rid of it. So they have this firm, stable conviction that they do not exist. Uh, was the first uh, neurologist uh, who diagnosed this called this nihilistic delusion. Right? And there are um, so many of these examples. I've seen um, videos, you know, where people after certain brain re lesions, typically old people, cannot recognize themselves in a mirror anymore. Mirror self-recognition, we now know, is some chimps have it, some bottlenose dolphins have it, some elephants have it, human children develop it between 18 and 25 months, the capacity to recognize themselves on videotape or in a mirror, and some human beings also lose that after brain re lesions or an old age dementia, and then they have the problem that there's a stranger in the mirror. There's a strange person there always, and they complain. And I've seen this video where you stand with this patient in front of a mirror and say, so this is not you. Yeah. And who's the person standing next to that person? I say, yeah, that's you. And now I'm holding your hand in front of the mirror. Yes, you are. Do you see this hand <coughs> in the mirror? Yeah, that's your hand. And then you touch the patient's hand and say, and whose hand is that? That's just the other person's hand. You know, and it, uh, the, the amazing thing is, is that this, say, loss of self-recognition is so robust <coughs> or so closed. Philosophers sometimes say cognitively impenetrable. It doesn't help to argue or to explain to the patient. The, the, the phenomenal experiences is not me in the mirror. It stays absolutely robust. And that's transparency. You know, that's the trouble you have when you have a transparent model of reality or if yourself and something goes wrong. Then you suddenly have certainty that you do not exist, certainty that there's a stranger in the mirror. And we better take, I, I think something we have also learned through science in the last century is to finally take these people seriously. Don't think they're hysteric. Or, you know, they're trying to catch our attention. They are having an experience it's which is impossible or, in, you know, inconceivable if we accept a kind of a, a standard uh, phenomenological model. In other words, we have, we think that the, uh, you know, the, uh, the experience of reality of, you know, a well-adjusted kind of, allegedly well-adjusted, sane, right. rational, responsible adults is this kind of, uh, this model for the way in which, you know, um, all the possibilities of experiencing the world um, must be understood. And interestingly, like with this examples, like the ones you've just given, you have something that is, um, we can't imagine what it is to experience yourself as non-existent uh, or not to recognize yourself in a mirror. That's um, an, an, an interesting point. Why can't we? Yes. I think it is because imagining, I mean, also very different people, for instance, people, on spiritual paths or so people interested in meditation, spiritual practice, often would also be interested in actively simulating or emulating a state of no self or a non-centered awareness or something like that. Why can't you do it? Because just as you said, simulating in that case is a form of inner action. Mm. It's not only outer action, it's also inner action like directing your attention for instance. Mm. And running a film in your mind actively and you know, making a plot for that film creates this quality of agency. And there you have a self. Mm. <laughs> you know? So there are certain, certain things you cannot actively simulate because you get this sense of inner effort. I'm doing this, I'm controlling this, and there is yourself. Um, so in that sense, some things are inconceivable. Mm. So, to, to, following on from this, you, you, you talked about the, um, you know, the, the production process that kind of, uh, mm. that, you know, uh, undergirds conscious experience. So, and I know you've, you've done a lot of work on this, so how much now do we actually, how much is known about the mechanics of this process, the, you know, the backstage machinery 
that generates um, the, uh, the phenomenal self model and the experience of, uh, of reality. How, and the reason I want to ask you about this is because obviously the more we understand it, the more we can manipulate it. So well, first, very little, mm -hmm. and um, having eminent experts in the audience, I will not dare okay. <laughs> to amateurishly explain you the mechanisms. But uh, there is something, I mean, the first thing we have learned um, is that what many philosophers didn't want to believe is that certain contents of conscious experience can, in a very isolated and well-circumscribed way, disappear. You can lose color vision just for one half of your visual field. You, know. you can lose uh, the feeling of shame or guilt and just that after a certain brain le uh, um, lesion. We know, for instance, some of us strive to be moral or ethically integrated people. You know, we're very vulnerable in this. If some physical event in our brains, brain happens, we will never be able to do that. We will never be you know, able to emulate the pains of others or be interested in the damage we do. Um, we know, new, for instance, we learn new things about antisocial personality disorder. Mm. You, have, you can have people, you know, you can, and it has been done, put people in a scanner uh, who have been diagnosed and who are in prisons. I uh, will not go into any details, but the ugly truth is you find things, you know. If you put 100 people with antisocial personality disorder in a scanner, you do find things, uh, very localized things, uh, in part. So, and so for many things, you know, we've learned uh, a little, uh, a blood vessel that explodes in your brain, a tumor here, and this can selectively disappear. You know, and that can selectively disappear. And that was actually the basis for scientific neuropsychology because if, if you know <coughs> A, you can lose A without uh, B, and you can lose B without A, you know, these things must be two building blocks, functionally dissociable. And from this, we get an idea of the architecture of the mind, and we have a lot of data about what you can lose, you know, you can lose color vision or just certain kinds of smell or certain aspects of language comprehension um, and other things you cannot lose in an isolated fashion. But I think there is in the consciousness community with which I've been very much involved during the last 15 years, there is something like a basic consensus. Of course, there's no theory, there is no consensus among philosophers competitive neuroscientists push different models. But the general idea is that for every conscious content, say like the blue cap of this bottle here or something, there is a minimally sufficient neurocorrelate. So there's some process in your pr brain, a set of properties that you cannot make smaller anymore without it disappearing, that's minimal, and sufficient, this by itself um, is brings about that conscious experience. Now this whole notion, people look for the neural correlate of consciousness, a whole research industry does this for about 10 years, you know. This brings other aspects with it, you know. If there are, at least in some cases, local, locally sufficient causes in the brain, you can do all th kinds of things with electrodes, with new drugs. Um, uh, and I mean, a very general thing I could go more into detail here is, but we will be able to technically control our conscious minds to a much greater extent uh, in the decades to come than we could in the past. Of course, human beings have always done this, you know, through drumming, through sacred mushrooms, through various magical herbs, through caffeine, opium, you know, religious rituals. Human beings have always tried to engineer and manipulate their mind. There's a, a long tradition of consciousness technology in the history of our speci species, you know. Art, for okay. instance, okay. right? Uh, and uh, now the instruments will get more precise and we will probably also know what we're doing. <laughs> in the past, we were okay. always testing out stuff and then suddenly we got addicted or something okay. nasty happened, you know. Um, do you, why do you think now we're in a better position to 
understand what, what we're doing. What it, so consciousness technology is, seems to have existed as long as human culture or civilization in some form or another. But clearly this is, um, you know, there's a phase transition here. Now that we understand, we understand mm -hmm. more about the machinery, mm -hmm. the neuro neurological machinery that kind of uh, generates conscious experience, um, we can intervene directly at the level of the, uh, you know, the brain, the neurological machinery itself. Why, but what is it, now, obviously we have a greater kind of uh, uh, scientific understanding, but when you, in what sense are we better informed now in, about what kinds of conscious states are desirable or undesirable? Not at all. That's uh, what I think, that's a completely different issue. Okay. I mean, with every science, technology follows on its heels, and the ugly thing is, oh, I don't know how to say that, uh, in English, it, it gets coupled to a capitalist logic of exploitation and marketing, right? It's never, typically the technologies are not developed in the way of how would they do us good mm. or how would we, um, you know, it, it's under a profit or also dominance oriented general um, idea where these um, <coughs> technologies are developed and marketed. And now we have this word neurotechnology, and it's actually one of the things I do with the group, applied ethics for neurotechnology. So we have brain implants, people develop new so-called cognitive enhancers, you know. One question, <clears throat> just to make this concrete, people are discussing is, what would happen if we had a safe um, way without side effects to do something like moral enhancement? if we um, developed a kind of pill that wouldn't make you addicted, but w which would increase altruism and pro-social behavior, or your capacity for empathy, or your uh, capacity for insight in ethical issues. Um, somebody, I think, would come and say, okay, everybody who wants to act ethical at all knows that he's constantly failing and wants to improve his own ethical integrity. If new tools are available, it's even an obligation, um, you know, uh, to improve your own morality, so to speak, if new instruments uh, come along. This could happen in the next two, three, five decades. There are <coughs> some first pilot studies to show that this can be done pharmacologically. Somebody is going to say, take the role of the government and say, um, we want pro-social behavior, don't we? We all want pro <laughs> don't you? <laughs> you know, uh, that's one example. But um, before we, maybe I'll just give you uh, an example. I mean, so there are brain implants, there are all kinds of new, um, the first area in which we see it is me medical neurotechnology. There are new and better ways to he help people, you know, with, se with epilepsy, serious brain damage. Um, Parkinson with that couldn't be tra treated depression I've seen 2006 we had these cases for instance you have patients who have a really severe uh, um, depression that cannot be treated by anything no you know nothing works and then they try directly stimulating with an electrode and they immediately report uh, about a disappearance of the painful void, as, it, as they call it, you know, this utter emotional emptiness that hurts uh, in two, three seconds, and even that visual details become more crisp in the room. Um, I don't know how many people know these avatar experiments I was I involved in with my, uh, myself, so in 2007, some people, a Swedish scientist, Henrik Ersson, and a group in Switzerland have done these experiments where you would see an image of yourself, you were filmed from behind, and it would be inserted in virtual reality. You would be synchronously stroked on your back and see while your own body standing in front of you was being stroked. And for some people, this generates uh, the experience of jumping into the avatar. So the phenomen phenomenal experience is of I am this um, jumps there. The phenomenology of identification, you can ad identify with an avatar. This has been wildly over-reported in the press. I was 
at a press conference in London myself, I've never experienced something like that. We were hunted by the world press for four days and they all, you know, told people out of body experiences are hitting the lab and it's not true because in an out of body experience you really see from an elevated perspective. In these experiments you don't see out of the eyes of the avatar. Um, there's, everybody think now um, video games are going to be really cool and addictive, you know, and now this is it, we're going to go in through the screen, which is totally false, you know, this effect is very weak, it doesn't work for everybody, it just works in a passive condition. But now, <clears throat> there is another project, now I'll just give you one example where this may go and where this may affect society. It's called the Vera Group, it's scientists from different countries, I'm in that group too, and they want to build, it's called virtual embodiment and robotic uh, re-embodiment. The idea is to enter with your sense of self, either an avatar in a virtual environment or a robot, while it senses and moves. My official position is this will never work <laughs> um, for various reasons. <coughs> But I'm also impressed <laughs> with what these kids are doing uh, in only two years. So uh, 10 days ago, I was at the Weizmann Institute in Tel Aviv. And there, for the first time, they, people in a scanner can control an avatar directly with the fMRI signal in a scanner. So this is something called a motor imagery brain computer interface. So what you do is you imagine you do a movement with your right hand and then directly the computer takes that signal from the scanner, wirelessly a robot will move or an avatar in a virtual scene will move to the right. You imagine um, I move my left hand and the avatar will turn left and you imagine I shuffle my feet and the thing moves forward. Of course it's much more complex than that. But what we have now is, for instance, uh, one video I saw already a couple of months ago is you sit there with glasses on and just with your thoughts, so to speak, by moving the self-model in your own brain, you control this little humanoid robot, it's about that high, and you make it walk. And this robot has camera eyes and you've got these glasses on. And you see through the robot's eyes while you control it just by imagining body motions of yourself. So this is already a sense of active embodiment. But then the funny thing is, you know, the subject made the robot turn around and looked at himself. Uh, so where's yourself? I mean, wh where is it in that moment? You tell me. And so what I saw um, last week in, in Israel is that they did this from Israel to uh, France. So somebody uh, lies in a scanner and the robot is in France in a lab, it goes through the internet and they can just see with the eyes of a robot in France and just control it, just lying in a scanner in Israel, so to speak, by, by their thoughts alone. Maybe this never goes anywhere. I think, still think there are major technical obstacles <coughs> for fully embodying the sense of self in you know, second bodies, third bodies, or something like that. But I may be wrong. Maybe in 30 years, all these smart people have overcome these obstacles. Are these obstacles, um, I mean, are they simply empirical obstacles or like technological obstacles or you say well, fundamental? If, I think there's a principled okay. um, problem. The human self-model, the self-model that is active in your brain right now, which you think you are, you, the system as a whole, who confuses itself with the model in its own brain, right? Um, in our case, this is um, anchored in gut feelings, in interoception, in proprioception, in this massive feedback from your body. And how would one, you know, cut that connection to transpose it into a robot or uh, into um, an avatar? So far, these avatars, they will soon give um, haptic feedback. You get suits and vibrators and things that you actually feel you touch something when you act in the virtual world. But how are you going to get this whole inner world of feelings? How should any you know, avatar feed that back to you? So I think th this will not work. We will all, always be strangely disembodied in these virtual worlds. 
but I may just, may just be wrong. I'm, you know, I'm just a stupid philosopher. And there are all these smart young neuroscientists and programmers. Now that's an example. Imagine in 30 years that would work, merging virtual reality technology with neurotechnology. What would that do um, to our culture, to our societies, you know? Um, would it <clears throat> what would it do to people who still want to believe in an immortal soul? You know? Um, I, you, you mentioned something uh, very important. You, you said that, for instance, um, some of the, uh, the basic norms, or the ethical and moral mm -hmm. norms that we, uh, we prize and we try to inculcate in, mm -hmm. in others, especially in, in children. So, for instance, empathy, responsibility, etc., etc. Now, um, one upshot of what you've just said is that if a brain lesion can morally incapacitate someone, if someone is simply incapable of uh, responding in what we consider to be the appropriate ethical way, simply because of like a neurological mm -hmm. uh, deficit. Um, this, I mean, do you, I mean, is this, you know, <coughs> the famous, you know, most philosophers have said you can never, um, there's a kind of a, a divide between the is and the ought, between sure. reality and or, uh, the norms in, in terms of which we judge things to be either good or bad. Um, <coughs> and. If it turns out that um, our evaluations of our basic fundamental moral <coughs> categories are simply a function of having the relevant neurological functioning and organization, um, does this mean that any, you know, the, the attempt to give morality or ethics some kind of, uh, the word the philosophers usually use is transcendental, some kind, mm. of, uh, some kind of status that is irreducible to the physical and biological domain. Does this completely destroy this kind of... Um well, I have so much to say to this that I don't know uh, where to start, actually. I mean, a simple thing that has become very clear is moral behavior has not always been he here on this planet. There okay. have been millions of years where there was no moral behavior. Second, many animals have moral behavior too. For instance, monkeys, you know, if you offer them a bad deal, if you see the other guy gets a raisin and I just get a piece of cucumber, they throw the cucumber at the experimenter's head, um, which is irrational, self-damaging behavior. It would be, in an evolutionary setting, better to take, keep that and eat it. So we have developed uh, strategies where we, some animals, you know, represent the interests of the whole group and they punish, I guess, perpetrators is the English word, or free riders. Mm. That, that's not human. We have a long history of the evolution of, you know, moral behavior, group cohesion, and in us, it has taken a completely different dimension. But there are, you know, many aspects to this. One aspect is we know there's an evolution of morality. We know there's a big difference between saying it is simply some neural da da da, or it is to say there is also a neural description, or that there are neural conditions to make moral behavior um, possible. That's an important distinction. A human being can be described on many levels of description at the same time, and I think many descriptions as a person, or subpersonally, brain, they can all be true at the same time. So we we should be very careful with this nothing but reflex. Mm -hmm. You know, this is often uh, a mistake. But still, if what the example you brought is true, there's also an ugly mirror image. You know, if I can lose my capacity for perspective taking, for empathy, for pro-social behavior, um, for altruism by microscopic events in my brain, it could also be that saints, or people who are very good at this, or people who have founded um, religions, were not in any interesting sense responsible for that, for what they did. Because, you know, I've recently, somebody has calculated that there were a hundred, about 106 billion, billion in British English, it's also billions, right? Yes. 1,000 millions, <laughs> right. Um, or is no, it only no, American? In English? American, yes. Um, <laughs> a billion is a million million for in 
No, a thousand millions. But, and for Americans, it's a thousand. Okay, for Americans, we are seven billion people now, okay. and about 106 billion human beings have lived on this planet. And you know, there have been people who were two meters 40 tall, and people had that size. People were enormously fat athletes, super intelligent people. It's only natural that in these billions of people, that some have emerged with brains, just by chance, perhaps, who are so em enormously empathic or you know, full of loving kindness, whatever, um, pro-social, that they just look like saints to everybody else, or uh, divine. And the, I'm not, this is not my position, but um, there is, for instance, a temporal lobe epilepsy theory of religious experiences, you know. There are some ultra-reductionist people who say that those people who founded religions because they had visions of God were actually a specific kind of epileptics. I think this is scientifically false, but you see where it could go, you know? Yes. We could find the neurocorrelates not only of this turquoise here, but also the neurocorrelates of religious ecstasy, for instance. Um, so, um, following, so why, given that you're, you, know, you don't accept nothing but reductionism, you don't accept, or what Dennett sometimes calls greedy reductionism, <laughs> why so wh why not? Why is, uh, do you think it would be a mistake to infer from the identification of you know, neural correlates for empathy, responsibility, et cetera, et cetera, the, you know, the claim that these ethical uh, norms are nothing but kind of physical states? Why is that identification illegitimate? Um, um, I think, how, okay, there will be a story about how moral behavior emerged. I think it, it doesn't say anything about ethics in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, there will also be a story about how religious behavior um, evolved. There are first good ideas. People are working on it. I think it doesn't speak to the question if God <coughs> exists or not. It just speaks to the question how, why so many people believe in God. So I think these are distinct questions. But I'll take, I'll tell you about. A conflict I have, for instance, I have very strong ethical I intuitions. For instance, I think we should, we must very think about what valuable states of consciousness are. We shouldn't also only think like in the tradition we did, what is a good action. But now that we will be able um, to, you know, manipulate, amplify, inhibit our conscious uh, experience to better and better degrees technologically we should also have something like a normative psychology. We should think about, we, nobody can help us, in what states of mind do we want to live? What states of consciousness do we want to show our children? What states of consciousness is it ethical to inflict upon animals? What states of consciousness would we eventually like to die in? I don't know if anybody has thought about that, but what state of consciousness would you like to die in? Maybe neuroscience can help you uh, when you've made a decision. You know, all um, these questions. So on the one <coughs> hand, I think we should think hard about an ethics for consciousness. It's necessary in this historical transition. On the other hand, um, as a philosopher, my official position is normative sentences have no truth values. So what does that mean? <laughs> it means um, a truth value of one means a sentence is true, a truth value of zero means a sentence is false. Some sentences have no truth values. For instance, sentences in literature, in poems, you know, they are not true or false. Sentences like, you should not kill, or you should think about what a good state of consciousness is, might also be sentences of this kind, which there's no knowledge in them, because the world is just silent. We kind of ask the world, what is a good action? And the world stays quiet. I mean, in a nutshell, there could be no ethical facts in reality that make sentences like you should not kill, true or false. This seems likely to me on philosophical grounds. It's called non-cognitivism. I hate it. I'm, I'm, I'm a philosopher who hates a lot of his own official positions. Uh, but if that were ultimately uh, true, right, that there is Strictly speaking, no, nothing like ethical knowledge in an interesting sense that we cannot know what a good action is. Why should we? 
But if we can't look, I mean, <laughs> yeah. given the logic of your own account, if we, it's a mistake, you said there's no one can help us when it comes to kind of constructing norms or like deciding what's right or wrong. If, I completely agree with you, it's a mistake to think we can read norms off nature. The world is silent. The world doesn't tell us mm. what to do or not, not, not to do. Then isn't it a mistake to, to, you know, to claim that moral judgments are, are devoid of truth value simply because the world is silent? You're looking in the wrong place. Uh -huh. The world is not the place to look for right. the truth or falsity of those normative mm -hmm. claims. And in, in which where, case, where should I look? Well, it, the, the claim would be that there are um, uh, um, perhaps truth is not always about correspondence, and mm -hmm. there's, you know, there are alternative kind of accounts of yes. truth, which is to say that you know you can be justified in uh, you know claiming that something is true, uh, and the the justification for that uh, claim is uh, about you know the internal consistency of a mm -hmm. set of beliefs or thoughts. Um, so this is what's called coherentism in, in philosophy. But mm -hmm. um, but the claim is that um, when thinking, and th this, I, this I want to ask you about the distinction between um, thinking or rationality mm -hmm. and consciousness. Now, I think it's absolutely imperative to distinguish thinking from consciousness. I, I think that. Consciousness is, an, is a natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I don't think that thinking is a natural phenomenon. Yeah. And the ability to deploy concepts rationally is, is not, uh, um, it, it's not a supernatural phenomenon either, but it emerges on a different level. Um, now, is it possible, um, first of all, do you accept some version of, of that distinction or do you think it is untenable? And secondly, um, if you don't believe, if you don't accept any such distinction, then in many ways, like given that, you know, if, 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 if you're kind of a really thoroughgoing kind of naturalist, but the, the claim is that ultimately um, you become, you know, evolution doesn't care. Evolution will simply kind of inculcate whatever kind of uh, is, you know, uh, amplifies adaptation. In other words, mm -hmm. whether it's chimpanzees or bonobos or humans, um, what is, um, you know, whatever is evolution will simply select for those, um, you know, characteristics which are kind of beneficial. But then it's a mistake to try to kind of write, you know, uh, surely, you know, the consequence of that move is to say, just forget about right and wrong altogether. It's ju just about survival, adaptation, reproduction, and then, you know, um, you know, the some kind of uh, thoroughgoing nihilism would follow, that there's no right or wrong, it's all an illusion. Um, all there is is kind of reproduction, survival, adaptation. And if it so happened that, you know, um, you know, cruelty, ruthlessness, unscrupulousness are, you know, maximally adaptive, then, you know, we should, mm -hmm. who are we to kind of, to tell? You know, right. kind of evolution, what's desirable or undesirable? Well, I think that I really agree on this distinction between intentional content and phenomenal content, although they overlap. Consciousness and thinking is not the same thing. One difference, for instance, is that we know that conscious experience is a locally determined phenomenon in the brain. Um, to have visual experiences, you do not need eyes. You all have visual experiences at night when you're dreaming, when your eyes are shut. Um, so this, in some ways, this is a local phenomenon. I'm quite convinced that almost all forms of thinking are things that are distributed processes that we do together. We are thinking together right now. The conscious reality models are all in our brains right now. But what really connects us, or maybe it's just like a distributed process running on us, maybe there is no ownership for thoughts. I think this is also one of the reasons why Descartes was wrong. It's just not true if you take your phenomenology seriously that there is an I think. Thoughts are there. That's the phenomenological truth if you look closely. Uh, they are like moving clouds in the sky. So I think Human intelligence, rational thought, is almost always an extended process, a social process, an intersubjective process. 
Of course, we can simulate that internally. Sometimes we can sit in our armchair in our room at home, and then I think, yeah, but then Ray said that. You know, so I simulate a social situation. Um, so I think rationality is probably to a large extent something above brains. It's a group phenomenon, just as is science and philosophy. There is something like a history of theories. That is something no animal has created before us. We have a history of thought, a history of theories. You know, we're all connected to each other through books, the internet, and it's actually a conversation that runs over centuries. Uh, it's a completely new uh, phenomenon, and that conversation can come to conclusions and find out things like um, most of your conscious experience is transparent and by the way the paradigm paradigm example for me in normal states for a conscious experience that is not transparent is the experience of thinking when you think thoughts the experience is one of operating with mental representations as philosophers say that might be true or false. This transparent microphone model, it's not true or false. It's just bloody real, you know. It, my body, the contents of my body image, that is always real. I have no doubts. There's this certainty about it. You know, with this rational thought is something that just came very recently in evolution. It is so slow <coughs> that we can introspect the construction process. And that is how, where we suddenly realize this is something that is happening in me, something that creates a media. There might be a crack in the window or spots on the window. It might be false, you know. And that is also what enabled us human beings to distance ourselves. I think. Many animals probably just have a fully transparent model of reality, which means in a certain sense they are caught. They may have rich, dense experience, maybe richer than us in smell or body perception, or also in anger and rage and pain, but they cannot distance themselves because this process of representing while you know that you are representing hasn't yet started. It's not running on these animals. And um, in us, go to Edinburgh, uh, go to Andy Clark. Uh, active externalism is a, a current philosophical term for it, right? Uh, there are a lot of very good English philosophers uh, working in this domain of distributed cognition. I remember when 11 years ago, uh, I came to San Diego for the first time for a year as a German philosopher, you know. And the first person I met was this um, PhD student in the philosophy department, Deborah, and said, so what are you working on? And uh, she said, yeah, I just came back from Nigeria. I've been living in tents for nine months. I said, yeah, for philosophy PhD? Yeah, I was observing and filming chimps, uh, you know, troops of chimpanzees in the jungle. I said, uh, and what are you writing your thesis on? I uh, distributed social cognition. And that's when I first realized, ah, philosophy is a bit different here, you know, <laughs> than in old fashioned yes. Germany. Yes. You know, that was a, a baffling experience um, for a young philosopher to go uh, to observe chimpanzees for months to write about that process, for instance. Um. So I'm getting sidetracked here. You better no, no, ask no, me. Uh, <laughs> I want to come back to this issue about. Um, I think I'll, I'll ask one final question, and then I think I'll invite anyone to kind of who wants to to kind of <coughs> to ask us a question. But about the distinction between transparency and opacity, which you just mm -hmm. explained, emphasised, which in, in a way distinguishes um, thinking from mere consciousness. In, in other words, uh, the capacity to kind of um, to uh, you know, to represent your own representation, mm -hmm. to be able to have that kind of reflexive distance so that your representation of the world is not simply kind of a, a transparent vehicle, but something that is, you know, mm -hmm. um, itself represented. So that, that it's precisely this distancing, you know, this, this kind of distancing, um, which makes, you know, which I think is, makes thinking in, in 
philosophical sense possible. And in, I want to ask you then, why is transparency, if transparency is a special form of darkness, then consciousness itself, or brute consciousness, is darkness. Animals live in darkness, precisely yes, because I think the world is completely transparent to them. In a certain sense, especially the transparent self model, the transparent conscious self model, is one of the nastiest uh, inventions of Mother Nature because it forces an organism to, how to say in English, to, to irrevocably appropriate their own pains and needs and fears and whatever, impulses. They cannot distance themselves from it. Mm. We cannot for many of these internal states. Because they're transparent, they're not just hunger or um, jealousy or horniness. They are my horniness, my hunger, my jealousy, and they are real. If anything is real, it's pain, for instance. Mm. I mean, that is real. Uh, that's fully transparent, that's owned, and it's not easy. No, I guess no philosopher has managed to distance it himself from his own pain. Um, so it glues animals to the logic of survival in a very nasty way by creating not only joy and pleasure and reward, but also suffering. And um, it's, maybe it's an evolutionary accident uh, that something like us appeared for, for various reasons because some of us at least behave, behave strangely and now um, instead of trying to have children, try to understand the process as a whole, which th that wasn't meant to happen, you know, and write books and things. Uh, so, or, you know, shave their head and become monks and don't have children anymore. No animal does something like this. So I think one thing many people, a fact that many of us repress um, is that the evolution of consciousness on this planet. One way to look at it is also to see, as an, look at it as an expanding ocean of suffering and confusion and deepening, you know, and that's not funny uh, if you look at it. You know, the, uh, th many things just happened which are actually not funny, um, like the evolution of predators. Mm. Why should animals evolve who have an absolutely, like all of us, transparent urge to survive. And the only way to do this is like philosopher Schopenhauer said, to become the living grave of hundreds of other sentient beings. That's not nice. You know, some of these um, naturalists have a tendency to glorify the process of evolution. And I really respect Richard Dawkins and there's a big truth in the greatest show on earth. But that show really has two sides and uh, something I find really interesting also for philosophers in that respect is the conscious self model was many of us think it got ever better and better and better in evolution. We knew our, knew our bodies better, we introspected more brain states. But it can actually be shown that there was also an evolution of self-deception. That is, to have self-models with false content is really adequate. I mean, I, I give you some simple examples. Um, uh, like, you can show that all <coughs> parents directly, not cognitively, directly perceive their own children as more pretty and intelligent as everybody else. If there was a, a famous study in the 70s, if you ask American college professors if they think they're about average or over average, 96% of them have the firm conviction that they are over average in their achievements. And they all know it cannot be true, it's unlikely. And if you, there's research starting on this, you know, it starts with threatening behaviors in animals. It, it's good if you want to, you know, pick a fight with somebody or impress somebody to enter a delusionary state for a certain time where you actually believe that you're stronger than this guy yourself, so you don't give any, off any subliminal cues. If you're, if you're a politician and your job is to lie to thousands of people all of the time, and uh, you know all these people have develop, developed cheetah detector models, they look at your body language, at every move you make, um, what kind of a guy it is, the solution to it is, is to develop a delusional self-model 
uh, to at least in the moments when you publicly appear and speak, to actually believe it. Because then nobody can detect the cheating or um, you know the deliberate lying. So there's a new Robert Trivers is um, the important author in this. There's a new scientific approach developing showing that self-deception is not only something to protect yourself, you know, denial from things you don't want to know, past failures, but it's actually a strategy of aggression um, to become momentarily deluded and, um, I mean, the statistically strongest effect, if you look for human catastrophes, it's overconfident males. You know, you can show if you analyze wars, you can always show that with every single war, uh, after only a few days, there is surprise that this takes so long. Because everybody before generals, experts, has thought, this, you know, piece of cake, that's gonna be fast, they are weak. And uh, it is typically, you know, overconfident males that also cause major historical catastrophes. But, you know, many people have beliefs that we know that are false. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, that children make you happy. It's not true. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, if you put buzzers to people's arms and just let them report, how do you feel now? Happy or unhappy? And you do it with people who don't have children. It's very clear parents are more often unhappy and stressed. If you do interviews with them, there's this robust self-description that their life has become much, become much more meaningful and happy since they have children. It's clear that these forms of delusion would have been evolutionarily successful. These people were our ancestors, you know. Uh, people who became monks and didn't have children, they were not our ancestors. Um, you get the general yes, idea. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, just one, one final question. So how, given the, the, the pressures on us to deceive, you know, the pressures on self-deception, given how useful and how advantageous self-deception is, how do we measure, is it, Possible that you know, um, you know someone like uh, I, I know Scott Baker, whose work you know has written about you know this the blind brain theory of consciousness. His, he takes this the stance that we are systematically deluded about ourselves and about um, the world we inhabit, and that our predicament is truly desperate because you know everything we confidently believe about ourselves and the world we inhabit is almost certainly, um, you know, a kind of a false, basically. Now the, the, the problem is how do we measure, how is it possible to measure the discrepancy between, you know, the world as it really is and the world as, um, as we, you know, misperceive it in order to, to reproduce better, to adapt better, well, to do things. First of all, he can say something like that. Okay. He can write books like that. We can do science about this. And there's an enormous knowledge about the different, do you say biases in English? Biases, yes. Biases. Yes. I mean, we know the statistics. That's well-researched uh, human beings have. And it looks like we either we delete an information, if it was painful or something, it, it destroys our self-image, <coughs> or we keep it unconscious and we use the conscious self model for action control, but in a crisis, suddenly that uh, unconscious knowledge, knowledge pops up. And there are very simple, I mean, this fancy stuff in science, but simple, a simple procedure is, in Germany we have these recycling bags, different colors, yellow and blue. And uh, yellow <coughs> is general package and recyclable plastic. And people throw in an average about 30% of things in that don't belong in there, and they know it. You know, my wife, for instance, does this. <laughs> totally impenetrable. You know, you want to get rid of something and it's not the blue bag, it's not the black bag, it gets on your nerves, it's not on the compost book. So the yellow bag always gets everything. So if you ask people to estimate how many percent of false drops they do, you get a ridiculously, and you know, you've measured it, the person throws 30% of wrong items in there. Um, <clears throat> you get ridiculous answers like no or 5%. But it's very easy to get a very exact judgment. You give them the same questionnaire and say, what do you think, how many percent 
of misdroppings does your neighbor do? <coughs> and then it's absolutely accurate. <laughs> and it, there is no information about what the neighbor does. There's no information in the brain. The only source of information is what I do and what I constantly, you know, repress. But that's an accurate way of uh, getting out what people <laughs> do. <laughs> okay, I think we should, shall we answer, uh, I think yeah. we should open this up. Anyone yeah. would like to, okay, Pete's. Uh, yeah, we've got our, a microphone so, here as yeah. well. Yeah. 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 So, put your hand up then. Um, I think it's uh, Pete. Um, first of all, okay. uh, first of all, that was um, that was fantastic, um, uh, and I just want to push um, a direction that Ray was coming in with to do with normative standards and how we relate this sort of um, neuroscientific understanding of cognition mm -hmm. to um, normative standards, and it's particularly interesting insofar as. Um, so much of the, the, the neuroscience literature is, is concerned with pathology, which is in, an intrinsically normative notion. Mm -hmm. um, and and this, these pathologies are understood in, in functional terms. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have some kind of functional model mm -hmm. of how a system is supposed to work, and we derive certain kinds of normative conclusions about what kinds of conscious states are good and what kind of conscious states are bad. Um, what I'm interested in is the, the, the point you got to towards the end where you said, well, yes, thinking and consciousness are different. Thinking is some kind of socially distributed activity. Um, and what I'm interested in is, is whether or not you, you would agree with the idea that if thinking itself has a functional description, which is distinct from the sort of functional description, which neuroscientists work with in understanding consciousness, whether or not that functional description um, is sufficient to derive the sort of normative um, claims about what conscious states are good or bad that you're after. C certainly not. This certainly would be not. a naturalist fallacy, but um, one thing I think one has to see, I mean, thought is a g very general folk psychological term. Of course, there is, for instance, a little bit of conscious cognition. Sometimes we experience ourselves um, as thinking. Most of what cognitive scientists would vaguely call cognition is unconscious. I mean, most of the you know, computational load, the enormous efficiency we have is completely unconscious. One thing we've learned is to do a little math, you know, that's not difficult, but to call a bird catch a ball in different lighting conditions. That is computationally demanding. That is millions of years old. That's transparent, we just do it. But that is bodily intelligence. The little calculation, you know, it was easy to build a computer that beats the world's chess champion. What we don't have is a computer that can take the pieces themselves and move them, an embodied agent that could do that. So um, <clears throat> we may have a, a very distorted image of what the actual, where the density of the intelligence, the, the, you know, the compressed intelligence actually is, it may be in our body and not in that little bit of cognition, but I don't want to evade your question. I mean, that something is as it is, for instance, functionally in our minds or in human societies, um, I mean, nothing normative can be derived from that. Of course not. Uh, also, one thing which is very, very hard to understand for almost everybody is evolution is a process that had no direction and no goal. So the bodies, the genome, everything we have right now are results of a process that pursued no goal, that had no direction. And just one sentence recently, I talked to Michael Tomazello, who is a famous uh, monkey researcher in Leipzig, who <coughs> investigates the transition from biological to cultural evolution. And I just asked him, do you think that cultural innovations, you know, in monkeys and human beings and the whole history of culture, that that is a goal-directed process? Or is it also driven by chance events and self-organizing? says, of course it has no direction. Cultural evolution has no direction too. 
I mean, this is hard to digest, right? If, if, you, if I'm permitted a, yeah. a response and a, a, uh, okay, yeah. a very quick follow-up. I mean, my suggestion wasn't that somehow by moving the level of social evolution all the problems are solved. My, 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 my query was rather about whether or not there's something analogous to the abstract functional description of, say, computation, which mm -hmm. Turing came up with All right. for rationality. So if rationality is a social protocol, you know, we're running on TCP IP, it doesn't matter yeah. how it's implemented. Yes, right? but that if it could be described in an analogous fashion, yes. like a totally non-empirical fashion, would, it, <laughs> would that be a legitimate place from which to draw normative distinctions? No, I don't think so, but I, I would say the f to answer to your first question, philosophers have done this. Uh, there is logic, there is argumentation theory, there's critical thinking. All the fallacies are known. Rationality is an optimization process uh, with empirical data. We could formalize <coughs> what rationality is, but why should anybody act rational? Uh, I mean, why would that be good? Um, should we not rather alleviate human suffering, minimize the conscious suffering in all sentient beings? Why should we do that? Should we not increase the suffering in as many beings as possible? I think to give a rush, rational argument, as, to derive from a rational calculus that we should be nice, this will be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> People have tried to very, very, very final <laughs> point, though, is that the question is, what, what, how do we define nice? And it might be that nice is actually part of the functional calculus itself. Uh -huh. So it might be that there's such a thing as collective rationality, which is yeah, part okay. of the protocol. So okay. just, just justice sentence, might be part of the protocol. If we add an assumption, we set as values of what we know that almost all members of that collective would agree to, then you can do a lot. You know, like minimize suffering. Almost everybody <coughs> would agree to that. Um, if you can set that, then you can do a lot uh, from there. Any, any other questions? Uh, 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 yeah. So I have a question about your thoughts. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot. It was very informative and entertaining. Um, I have a question, your thoughts about that what we can do in neuroscience is we can measure modules and, and processes in the brain, basically we measure the hardware, but what is the evolution and development of ideas having an influence to our consciousness? So do you, for example, Richard Dawkins brought that forward with the meme theory, do you think it's possible that over time with the evolution of ideas we actually change sort of how we perceive the world and how our consciousness work, or is the hardware completely determining <coughs> our consciousness? Well, the, the problem, I mean, meme theory has a good and also, to me, very sexy intuition behind it, but the thing is we do not know what the smallest unit of cultural information transmission actually is, where its boundaries are, and we don't know the transmission mechanism. So right now it's all metaphorical. We don't have a good theory about mimetic evolution. But on the other hand, it's pretty obvious, I think. I mean, the computations going on in our brains are the results of millions of years of adaptation and evolution. But one thing that is very, very specific, specific about humans is that the environments we adapt <coughs> to also with our brains are increasingly self-constructed um, environments. For instance, medial environments, large societies like they've never existed before, theories and arguments. For instance, we have to emotionally somehow adapt to the knowledge that we are mortal. Um, that's a problem we have. Probably no other animal has, uh, has that. We have in our emotional self-model, we have this strong imperative, you must not die under no circumstances <coughs> and in our cognitive self model if we're intellectually honest it very clearly looks like it's going to happen mm -hmm. and uh, this is itself at least I maintain that a pressure on us to which we have to adapt for instance by developing a delusional system uh, so human beings have externalized cave paintings the content of their minds art books <coughs> 
And then our evolution is, uh, is a very different kind of evolution because we've created a cognitive niche for ourselves. And um, of course, um, this has all kinds of effects directly back on, onto our brains. If, if you get internet addicted, if you get acquired attention deficit disorder, um, this is a medial environment, it immediately changes your brain. Um, the German government has now defined diagnostic uh, criteria for internet addiction, for instance, and it turns out 540,000 citizens have that. In South Korea, 260,000 um, uh, children have been diagnosed uh, with internet addiction. That's something you can measure in the brain. That has something to do with attentional mechanisms and so forth. So culture, I, don't, I hope this was, goes to your question. Culture definitely changes our brains um, in, in, in many ways. And in most of these ways, I think we're not even aware how it does that. Um, I always give this example the last time, I don't know if ever anybody ever had a lucid dream, um, I became aware that I'm dreaming in a dream, was when, the, you know, in dreams the visual scenes always change so ab abruptly, and the dynamics with which the visual scene uh, changed was exactly the way with which when I click on another website, my screen, you know, it takes a few milliseconds, how a new screen comes in, and I thought, wait a minute, you're not surfing. And that's when I became aware that I was dreaming. And it shows you that, you know, just working with the internet changes your dream life already. You know, the visual phenomenology of your dreams. So I think there are a lot of things going on all the time. Yeah, um, again, that's a very interesting, I don't want to ask too many questions apart from this, this idea of distributed thought that we started talking about is, is in, incredibly interesting and I've always thought, you know, the, the Matrix is an awful movie for hundreds of reasons, but one of the worst, the worst things about it is it claims that these, uh, these machines are using human beings for energy when really they should be using them for processing, you know, they should be distributing the management of the world across these these computational devices, and it's that, it's that analogy that is going on, you know, the idea of um, distributed processing, the guy talking about TCP IP, um, these sort of different levels. Um, all fiction always gets there first, and there's, um, I don't know if you know the movies, um, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, um, these sorts of cyberpunk novels of the 80s, where um, they, they create the idea of this disease that runs at these different cognitive levels, so there's sort of diseases which are both a genetic disease and a code disease that can be transmitted by sexual activity and by um, sort of low-level um, programming by people who not only do they have this thing where this lucid dreaming thing you're talking about where there's a screen wipe but all they have to do is stare at a certain sort of image and it reprograms their brain and causes them to have you know long-term seizures and I'm wondering at what le you know whether at what level you think we're going to be using neuroscience to reconfigure things in the future, whether it's going to be right down to this genetic, um, you know, subgenetic level, or whether it's going to be, you know, back to maybe a, a more sort of psychoanalytic thing where we're talking about manipulating spatial representations and ideas of, um, of psychological objects. Which one do you think is going to be more rewarding in the future? And, yeah. Well, I don't know. Our future is absolutely open. Um, uh, our history has, we have a bad track record and, you know, in dealing with, uh, this is a major historical transition and we haven't yet understood what exactly this transition actually consists in. But, I mean, just one thing, I think neuroscience should, for instance, be applied in early education, even in preschool education, because knowledge about the brain tells us what the formative phases for certain you know, achievements you develop are in the brain. And when, say, a human infant needs what, and what stimulation, and I don't know, what security, what emotional security, we should bring this knowledge into the schools. And a very important thing in that context is we need something, a tradition or a discipline like media hygiene. We have to very early on to understand that, for instance, attention 
is a limited resource. You only have so much attention per day. So if you will, a computational resource evolution has put into human brains. You needed to properly listen to somebody. You needed to be able to walk in the forest by yourself and enjoy it. You needed to make love, else um, everything gets strange. And we have to also realize that there is an industry attacking us from the outside, the advertisement industry and the entertainment in industry, who are trying to rob us with all new tricks um, of this precious finite resource. <coughs> And I think one way to use neuroscience would be to somehow teach ourselves and our children that there is something there that you can lose, you know, if you, I don't know, if you're online for more than 90 minutes or for, with, on more than three channels simultaneously, and that there is something you can sustain, something you can stabilize, something that has to do with the quality of life, and that there are people who try to take it away from you with tricks. And um, if we don't get intelligent about this very fast, you know, like protecting ourselves against the new cognitive niche we've created for ourselves, the media jungle that grows around us, then we may have problems, you know. We may have, I mean, an obvious fact is, I'll just tell you a fact. I'm a professor of philosophy once a week. <clears throat> I give this 90 minute, pretty old fashioned frontal lecture with PowerPoint. The lectures I could give um, five years ago, I have no chance of getting through with them anymore now, five years later. Um, the kids that come from high school, they just can't. Um, I never finish a single one of my philosophy lectures now in mindset I could finish um, five years ago. I mean, apart from the fact that everybody is you know, on their mobile phones and surfing, um, during the teaching session is totally distracted and split. Apart from that, they just don't take it. Uh, the only chance you have is to add more visuals and more motion. And uh, with a discipline like philosophy, it's very difficult. Uh, so you could have, you know, a cultural change. You know, reading, books disappearing slowly from culture without anybody really realizing that it creeps upon us from behind. You know, I think we should put extra, in, you know, extra effort into observing this. And uh, neuroscience can help because neuroscience can describe things like acquired attention deficit disorder in a very precise way. And uh, I think that's where neuroscience should, for instance, be applied to. It's uh, one example. I think it's... We're uh, done? Oh, yeah, there's uh, one, yeah, um, there's one there's final one. There's one thing I didn't really understand. Um, you said that there's more connection with virtual reality. Yeah, so there's been more connection with virtual reality and neurology, uh, that that might change perceptions of the immortal soul. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, because I didn't really understand. Well, <coughs> right. So, um, I think... Um, I don't want to intrude on hurt anybody emotionally or so, but if one sees what neuroscience and modern philosophy does, it just is very, very obvious by now, more obvious than it has ever been in the past, that there is no empirical evidence and no rational argument to support the notion of a soul or a self as substance, something that could uh, exist independently of the brain. It, the, the number of philosophers who still believe in something like that is minimal. I don't know how many neuroscientists still believe in this. Nobody in the you know, expert world actually believes in this anymore. But 80% of mankind on this planet, 7 pe mil billion people, are firmly grounded in metaphysical worldviews and images of man. And I think one big conflict uh, that is there on local levels but also on a global level is it's you know for a certain time it was like that in your private life you could believe whatever you wanted to believe you could be a Christian or a Hindu and that was your private life and nobody laughed about you but if today for instance you would still maintain that the uh, Sun revolves around the earth people would laugh at you you know and there would be pressure on you social pressure, emotional pressure. 
And that may change, you know, as more and more people through science journalism, through school education, learn about the alternative explanations we have for the evolution of self-consciousness or the evolution of re religious faith even. This puts pressure on a large part of humanity. I think a, a large number of human beings are just not ready for this new, I call it the naturalistic turn in the image of man. And um, there are several factors that make this more critical. One is that most of the people who are firmly grounded in metaphysical images of man and the world and are ready to die for it are in the poor and underdeveloped countries and their population numbers are growing. And that knowledge, the information that there maybe is no such thing as an immortal self, comes from exactly those countries who have attacked, colonized, and exploited them in the past with shrinking populations. So also in a, on a global level, um, there is, so to speak, the seed for a major unrest. I don't know how one would call this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let us end on an understatement. <laughs> okay, well, I think, um, yep, I think we should have a break now. Um, so thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.